Good morning. Hello. Good day to everybody. Welcome uh, to the first of the virtual CIO fireside chats. I'm glad to have everybody online. Glad to have everybody listening in. Um, we look forward to a you know a lively and useful uh, discussion today uh, with our our speakers. Uh, let me start with uh, the ground rules. Um, well, I think everybody's on mute, so we should be in good shape. We're trying to keep the, the background noise uh, to a to a minimum. Um, we will be recording um, as, yeah, and uh, we'll send out the slides. We'll send it out to everybody who registers um, along with any comments. So, um, you know, I'll be taking notes. Uh, if you have any sort of questions or comments, um, please use the Q&A. Uh, I'll be monitoring the Q&A and We'll try to address the comments online. If we don't address them online, um, we'll jot them down. We'll craft notes, and we'll we'll distribute the responses to the the Q and A questions we didn't get. Um, we do have a poll, so let me launch uh, the poll. So in in a lot of webinars, people say, "Oh, you know, close your laptop, you know, focus on the webinar." And I think in this case, what I'd rather have you do is, you know participate, you know, add comments, um, add notes, um, provide suggestions, um, you know, by all means, you know, think of this as, as your organization. Um, so let me just give you just a little bit of background on um, the philosophy. So we started this group, um, the virtual CIOs, but it's also the fractional CIOs. Um, and our idea really is not to make it you know, tens of thousands of people. What we'd rather have is a focused group of folks who are experienced and experts and engaged. And you know, I've been pleased with how the the uh, the LinkedIn group is growing. Um, if you have colleagues that you know are interested in these topics, please by all means share with them. Get them to to join the LinkedIn group. Get them on our um, our mailing list. We see this as kind of a, an ongoing process. So we're going to um, ask you for your feedback, your input for the next sessions. Um, Sean's already come up with some topics for the next session. So we're excited about that. Um, but yeah, we would definitely like to uh, to keep this going. And um, you know, with that, let's go into more of the content. Um, so here are our two speakers. I'll let them introduce themselves a little bit, but here's the, the background, Sean and Nick. Um, just so you know, we developed this session um, using a process. So we went out and had conversations about it, and we came up with brainstormed, had a session about you know what questions to ask um, and that what we wanted to get out of this particular session. And one of the things that we definitely wanted to do was come up with some learnings. So as we go through the discussion, we want to come up with five things that all of us can use uh, as we go forward um, and maybe learn today and take away from today's session. So with that, I'm going to just sort of give a little background. Um, you know, the, the question is, what's new? What's different? Why do we spend our time here today? Um, and I think a few things have changed. Um, one of them is definitely more fractional work, more virtual work. Um, and that extends for our CIOs, CTOs, CISOs, but it also extends out in mark for marketing people, salespeople. Um, we're seeing more and more and more of that. Um, there have been some interesting studies um, by folks like McKinsey and other folks, not just about um the CIO world, although there are some studies on that, but also just fractional work in general. There are more articles about it. There are more Slack channels about it. There are more resources about it. So I think the world uh, is becoming more familiar with that kind of work model, and um, which means customers will be more familiar with it. MSPs will be more familiar with it. And so I think that's a model that's growing um, and it's going to be here to stay for for a little while. You know, we think of the fractional and the virtual CIO um, both as individuals who are providing consulting, but also MSPs are offering um, VCIO services. 
And so between Sean and, and Nick, we've got both of those uh, two areas uh, recommended. But there are some problems, right? And potential problems. So, and one of them is, you know, how do we keep the quality uh, of the services uh, high, right? How do we make sure that um, we do, people are getting the right impression, the right um, value, right, for uh, the services. Anyway, um, sounds like what people want out of this session is uh, how to grow their practice, how to find clients. So, you know, as we go through here, I think we have some questions about that. So we will um, try to address that and we'll try to, uh, you know, maybe have an extra session, um, a follow on session about, uh, you know, sales and marketing as it, as it goes. All right. So that's enough out of me. Um, let me hand this over uh, to Sean and to Nick. And uh, let's start by introductions, guys. Who who are you and, and what's your backgrounds? And Sean, if you want to go first. Sure, definitely. Thanks, Steve. The uh, This is a great idea, and I'm really excited to engage with everybody here. Uh, I think the fractional world, as Steve said, is expanding heavily. And I have been uh, dipping my toes into it for a matter of, say, 10 years, um, more at the beginning as a technology consultant and project management leader and rebranded more as the fractional slash virtual CIO. And I'd say the last four years. So right around when virtual work did become more of the natural uh, response for a lot of clients and businesses, I was definitely ready to answer that bell. And I think, you know, in my experience growing up as a um, IT um, manager, IT director, CIO, uh, I was able to really see the need for managing virtual teams and working and collaborating and communicating with leadership groups in a very efficient way while also detecting their culture. And so that really prepared me for this move into really doing it as a solopreneur. I do have a host company that is a CPA firm. So a lot of my background is focused in professional services and the ACE industry, which has a lot of crossover with professional services um, and the way that you're running your technology stack. But I also love to work with tech companies, life sciences, and supply chain. Turn it over to Nick. I think it's uh, what do they say, beauty before age or something like that. So I, I'll, yeah. I'll take the uh, mic now, right? <laughs> um, and and very similar, Sean. I, I was in. I've been in consulting my entire career from day one. Um, you know, working up through kind of the ranks, if you will, from a pure technical perspective, but also always customer facing. And it seemed to be there was always a gap, right? If you were just from my perspective, if I was only doing a specific engagement where, say, I was I was just advising on uh, data center best practices or, you know, hyperscale or something like that, there was a gap between, you know, the enterprise level leadership and then the actual doers of the, the things, right? So <clears throat> that's kind of where I found my niche is being that conduit or the glue between you know, the technical folks, given my technical background, and then also being able to be the 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 consultant for a business that is looking to capitalize on OPEX costs versus CAPEX costs and things like that from a from an FTE perspective. So that's where I really have seen the the increase of the the VCIOs, VCTOs. You know, one of one of the comments or questions was around uh, VCSOs as well, right? Is companies are trying to do more with less all the time because of markets and inflation, what have you, right? Technology is expensive. Um, and given the recent technology changes in, you know, machine learning and, uh, you know, large language model front end interpretations to, to leverage data sets, uh, that's changing even more. It's making it uh, increasingly harder to find the value that you provide to your clients. 
Um, so that's that's kind of the niche that I've played in throughout my entire career is being that advisory person and you know uh, having fun while I do it, right? Finding joy in helping them, uh, you know, clients getting from point A to point Z, even if it is a longer journey than you know someone would like to have, right? So VCIOs, they typically uh, are for shorter lengths of time versus someone that's a an FTE that's going to be there for 5, 10, 15 years, right? And they don't get exposure to new technologies or what the industry is actually doing. So, so could we um, just spend 30 seconds real quick in defining uh, VCIO versus a fractional CIO and maybe they're the same and maybe just the nomenclature is we use one interchangeably with the other um, or is there some distinction? Nick, what do you think about that or Sean? Yeah, go ahead. From, from my perspective, it's the, the VCIO really has the advantage, uh, at least from my experience, typically the VCIO comes in with a very specific uh, problem or business process to to go through and fix, right? Or define a process around it to help the the overall enterprise get to a, a successful state based on their business objectives. Fractional CIOs, fractional CTOs, those types of people are exposed to the entire uh, IT of, a, of an enterprise per se. Like uh, it's, you're not just specific on a specific problem. You're gonna, you're gonna have the exposure to everything, right? Typically, that's a longer engagement, um, you know, kind of like what I was just saying before, at least, uh, you know, you're looking at one to two to five year type engagements from a, a fractional perspective where VCIOs are are in and out and they drive the value on creating and, and executing upon a, a single strategy. At least that's from my perspective, what I've what I've been exposed to. Yeah, I think uh, to add on to that, I see three buckets starting to become very natural in this world for branding purposes, really. it's, And then it can be a lot of gray area after that. So uh, virtual CIO seems to be really be embraced by the MSP and IT vendor community as that snap on layered service, helping with strategic support mostly, but not always dipping into the operational or the other leadership focused elements that Nick mentioned. Um, I see a lot focused in security and ticket management and back office infrastructure. Um, the fractional, I, I think really backs up what Nick said is uh, I see it a lot as the you snap into the leadership group. And that person is also involved with budgeting, finance, collaboration with the C-suite, looking at innovation and strategy in a little bit of a holistic way. And sometimes in the fractional world, you are helping a company grow or get to an exit and being able to then fire yourself so that you can go move on and do other yeah. things. So it can be yeah. that level. And then the third one is interim, where you're being brought in specifically to create a succession plan for an outgoing CIO or you're also coming in to mentor somebody coming up and you just need to fill that gap. Um, it's usually very much time boxed. Maybe it's a year, two years. Uh, but that expectation is that you're, you're just going to be moving on, you know, once you do that. And those can be also really foundational approaches that can continue longer as a fractional piece, but it all depends on, you know, the, the moving and shaking of personnel these days, which, as we know right now, it's been pretty turmoil, a lot, a lot of turmoil. Cool. So looking back at your, how you got to be in the, in the virtual CIO world, um, <clears throat> what are some things you learned that could be tips to people that are, that are joining and wanting to get into this? We have a couple of folks on the call today that um, have had long successful careers, but now they're sort of looking at the horizon thinking, Hey, maybe I could be a, a VCIO too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I can take that. Yeah, first. I can. Oh, go, go, go. You want to go first on that one, Sean? <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Um, the the main, I think, benefit, and I've been talking to a lot of similar profiles where they've, you know, worked at 
you know, the Cisco's, the Apple's heavy tech backgrounds. Um, and now we're kind of like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to take my expertise in a little bit of a different way, maybe have a little more flexibility, not not crank 100 hours a week type of thing. Um, and it's it's definitely there for you. You you can really projectize your work cycle in this fractional world. You can also be very picky and choosy with the clients and industries that you work with. And that's probably the a big part of setting up your practice is who do you want to work with? What is the culture? What are your you know specific expertise that you can showcase to them? And like we say, you know, right there in the middle is what's a, a really good tip for starting up your BCL practice. It's how can you develop very quick wins for those prospects, not necessarily free wins, but quick wins to be able to show that value prop that can also engage your client very, very easily for you. So they say, oh man, I got to talk to Nick Moore. He's going to be able to really help me with this. Sometimes that also changes the value prop for them when they look at hiring an FTE person where they're saying, well, this might be like a two to three year cycle to let this person kind of start working their magic. Whereas with a fractional or virtual, it could be a couple months and you're, you're kind of changing the value prop with that quick win approach. And I've seen that be very successful for me. Got it. And very, very similar for me as well, right? Uh, starting the practice or starting, uh, you know, my my method or building my methodologies for approaching, you know, uh, these types of practices are very similar to what you were talking about, right? It's looking at it from a professional services perspective. One of the things that used to drive me absolutely insane was uh, like for value added resellers or for MSPs sometimes in the past, they were they would give away the cons consultative, uh, you know, IP or knowledge sets, right? You get an enterprise architect that's going to be with you forever, right? And they're going to help you decide what technologies to leverage and what processes to put in place. And it was it was giving away the cow, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You were getting the milk and getting the cow for free too. <laughs> um, so that's the I I it drove me insane that that was being just given away for free because there was a way to monetize it, right? Looking at it from that perspective. Um, the the other part of it is, you know, what what made what the why that I wanted to get into this type of role and and continuing down through this is uh, the ability to help multiple uh, enterprises, whether that be at the same time or or in linear. Uh, approach right to to Sean's comment, being picky and choosy and and knowing your bandwidth that you have to give to these clients because if you if you are really good at what you do, uh, you have to be able to learn to say no to these clients too right. Otherwise, they're going to suck you in and you're you're never going to leave. And for some people, that may be the best thing for them too right is they can still be fractional or via VCIO type person. and But you have your main client that you've always worked with for years and years and years. You're just brought in when a, a situation occurs or something comes up, you help them through that process and then you go away. It's like turning on and off a spigot as you need. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that shows the the value that you bring to that business because you're able to come in and add velocity or value day one and then you're able to go away and take the burden of the the uh, financials off of the business for a short period of time or a long period of time, and then they can re-engage you and you you pick up the the pieces back where you were and you start again with the with the your feet running right. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's kind of how I started was you know noticing the from the professional services side giving away the the free services. Um, but then also being able to, I tell people I, I probably have like uh, undiagnosed ADD or ADHD because if I'm too long in one position, I start to feel like I'm I'm in the trenches too long or I'm I'm doing the same thing day in and day out. And and for me, I like to embrace change. Um, it's something that's hard, 
but it, it exposes you to more technologies, better, you know, better ways to do things, maybe worse ways to do things, but then you can kind of build your knowledge around what you're doing um, and what your value is that you're providing to your customers or clients. So we had a question come in on the <clears throat> question line um, that's related. So I want to take a little bit of a tangent. It's about setting boundaries. So <clears throat> when you have a client, are there tips and methods to set boundaries with those clients so you don't get sucked in to every fire that's burning in the client's office, right? I've had to do that heavily in my career because <laughs> uh, especially when you give, you know, access to yourself, cell phone, Slack, et cetera, they're going to, they're going to ping it. I was just talking with Steve and Nick. I was on vacation last week and I did have to talk client down from pinging me constantly. Um, and it was an important situation. We were engaging in the final decision to get an ERP project authorized and it slipped. Um, the executive team basically said, well, I need you, Sean, we got to get on this call. We got to jump on a call. And you do have to set those boundaries that say, Hey, I, I understand this is important. I can't do it right now, but I'm happy to provide this feedback you know, get, let's get together there. You find ways around those important conversations to meet the scope of either the contract or the project you're working on. Um, so you do have to set that up up front. Now, with that said, there are change orders. And so when you look at it as a consulting gig, which I do still, I set up a very tight scope with phases and it's always going to start with that discovery assessment. So you get the lay of the land, especially with the new client. And then you designate stakeholders, designate the time that you're going to spend to be profitable for yourself. And you, you build in a margin, just like you would with any job. You don't have to do billable hours. In fact, I do everything fixed fee for that reason, so that the client feels that they're getting more value around that. But that it is going to be time boxed, usually by month or quarter, and it is going to be around certain areas of the project that you have to keep in scope. So when they go outside of that box, either by time or by utility, that's where you have to draw them back in. You say, hey, this sounds like a great project. I, I really think we're gonna have to talk about it. We're gonna have to dig in to what this means to the other piece of what we're already working on. And, the the main main nature of what other executives want to do is they always want to start implementing immediately. <laughs> so yeah, you right. have to you have to stay on top of that so hardcore because when they say, "Well, we're in, we're still gathering data here, people," and they say, "That's great. Now, can we start moving here in parallel?" I want to I want to start implementing. You have to always bring them back down. Now, in some cases. If you can bring in extra help to start implementing while you're still gathering data, it's possible. That's part of the value you bring as a fractional leader and that you can multitask, potentially just providing oversight. You're not, as Nick said, you're not getting into the weeds, but you yeah. have to make sure that your contract is stated appropriately because in the inverse, if something does blow up, they can come back and immediately say, I'm not paying you. I'm not, I'm suing you <laughs> for these types of breaches of contract. And you have to be able to always point to that contract and say, this is what yeah. I was here to do. So what, yeah, I'm hearing you, what I'm hearing you say is, is doing your homework up front, right? Investing in the time to be very succinct, very clear, very focused. Mm -hmm. So, and then communicative, right? So that your client has the exact right expectations um, both verbally and in writing, right? So that when something changes down the road, yeah. you can go back to that. It's okay. the opposite of sales in a lot of ways where you uh. do not over promise. You always <sighs> under promise to create those proper expectations. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 100%. Nick, you're, you're not in your head, Nick. You want to. Yeah, that's, that's that? exactly what I would say too. And, and one, one caveat or pitfall that I would uh, throw in there too is, I've run into in the past the, well, yeah, we can leverage the change order process, right? And 
sometimes you need to be able to uh, put into place a limit of changes within a given scope, right? Because if you don't, you're going to always have change requests or scope creep, one or the other. So it's, it goes back to exactly what Sean said, defining the deliverables and the, the milestones that you're trying to, to achieve for the business, but also setting the expectations that, hey, if you are going to consistently want changes and to shift gears and go this direction or that direction, there could be a penalty, right? There could be you know, a change order after you do three change orders, the fourth on then costs 50 bucks a time, right? Or something like that, right? It's it's not much, but it's something that gets the business side of people thinking of saying, oh, if I do this too many times, if I do another, you know, four changes, that's going to be 200 bucks, right? Or you say a thousand a pop, if you really don't want them to, to leverage that, that process. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it it hits them in the pocketbook where they're they're ultimately trying to save money by leveraging a VCIO or a CTO or what what have you, and then they're like, oh yeah, we need to stay focused, we need to stay driven to what we're trying to achieve for this particular project or deliverable. That's a great point. Hang on, <clears throat> I'm trying to get back to uh, to sharing the slides, but um. Let's move on to one of the questions that's popped up, which is um, how do you keep the the quality high? And this is sort of generally speaking um, for vir virtual CIOs. Is there training? Is there certifications? Um, how is the, what are the ways to do that? Yeah, I saw that question pop in about around uh, possible certifications. You know, in very many professional um, vocations like this, there are no certifications that are directly tied to it. I have to imagine that with the explosion of this world, there are going to be organizations that start tying training to the work and try to upskill it. But there are lots of consulting and project management focused um, certification. So I'm uh, in the PMI world. I have a PMP and there's a whole bunch of project management and business analyst certifications in that world that heavily apply to fractional executive work. So I would heavily recommend looking at uh, the starting with the PMP and look and then going up from there because there's agile project management. There's all these different types of aspects around it. Um, and then I'm sure Nick can speak more on this because when you do start going into the CTO CISO world, the security and other technical specific certifications go a long way. I mean, I know folks in this world that have alphabet soup behind their name yeah, because for they security in particular. Yeah. There's so many security things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's with it. That's exactly right. There's, and I've started to see this too, where, or there's and and part of what I do in my business, we do this as well. That we, we have a boot camp for full stack development. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you start to see the technical, bleeding more into the executive roles there again. I mean, if you look at the industry, uh, going back a little bit here, um, like the metas and the, you know, the Googles or even ABC, um, you know, those, those large enterprises are starting to set the standards where even the executives need to be contributing at a technical level, no different than say a developer, right. Or, a or a sysops, person that's that's managing data center technologies or something like that physical infrastructure or cloud infrastructure like they they want people to be hands-on now versus theoretical and in the cloud like in the in the clouds just talking about it right so it, it if you're really looking to be of the technical side of things versus more the business process it is beneficial to go out and say uh, you know look through a C, there's CISO ones now where you can be uh, like, this is, I wouldn't recommend it, but even CompTIA Plus has like their their basic certifications in cybersecurity, right? Or mm. or from a CTO perspective, you could try to do what I did and 
have alphabet soup and get every certification under the sun for cloud providers or, you know, pick your technology, EMC, Dell, you know, pick your, pick your poison, right? You could do that. Um, to me, it makes more sense for, for a VCIO to be aware of these technologies and how they integrate together mm -hmm. versus being a technical expert. And this gets into uh, know your limits, right? Know what you know, be very good at what you know, be the glue, and then reach out to your, your network or reach out to a, a highly technical individual that can be your your technical liaison. Because um, the, the, the old verbiage is, is true, you can't be a master at everything, right? Mm -hmm. You could be a master at a few things, but um, you're going to hit a limitation of what you're, what you're able to do. Um, whether that be time related, you know, to go back to what Sean said, you know, having a, a life work balance versus work life balance is, is huge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so knowing those limitations and making sure that you you leverage people that you know and trust, because ultimately building that trust with your client is what's going to continue your revenue streams and your continued relationships for them to bring you back when they have more problems or talk to their friend that they went golfing with and says, hey, you need to work with Sean to fix that problem that you're you're running into, right? So I'm I'm of the the mindset if you if you want to get technical, you absolutely can and go for those certifications, but just making sure you do your own continual learning and knowing what the industry is doing is a better use of time so that you can glue all the pieces together in my opinion. Got it. I'll I'll boost that really quick Steve too and say when you do look at peer groups specifically within industries, that can give you so much value outside of the technical knowledge because you're learning from people, you're developing those skill sets. So for example, I'm part of multiple CIO peer groups. Most yep. of them are free and you're, yep. you're just getting together once a month, kind of like this, sharing best practices talking tech enough to be dangerous where they're just like, Hey, anybody else having problems negotiating with this vendor? They just, you know, increase their rates 40%. What the <laughs> hell, where are we going? You know, let's move as a group. There's a lot of those discussions happening and it's, it's hugely valuable to not only you to showcase your value to your clients, but to the client itself, because you're moving to solutions that are tried and tested. You're not reinventing the wheel. Secondly, there are groups that are paid, but have those types of certifications, could be project management, um, could be leadership. I did a three-year leadership course specifically targeted to technical service um, and professional service provider industry companies that was great. And it really, I was the only true CIO in that cohort but I learned a lot from the other folks as well as the trainers in that mission. So you can go out, look at the industry groups, network, go to the conferences, understand who are the thought leaders, really get into it, schedule one-on-ones, do all those little things around networking like Nick mentioned. And then you have a lot of people in your back pocket say, hey, remember we had coffee at this blah, blah, blah. Um, I have a gig, I think, you know, made me think of you, let's, let's potentially bring you in. And especially when you have multiple people that can fit into a solution, you're providing that much faster and being able to go to market. So think about yeah. that, especially if you want to target one, two, three industries, it makes it much easier on yourself for time. Yeah. So I, I, I think what I'm hearing is, is building a community, um, Participating in peer groups, both online and and virtual, mm -hmm. um, are ways to learn and keep up. Um, I think we had a request for or question of how to join and find the peer groups. So I think one of our homework assignments is is to create the VCIO resource guide and in that put a number of both peer groups and Slack channels that we can then share with the our our group here uh, as a resource. Um, so moving yeah. forward one, one a little bit. Last thing on that too is, 
this sounds, it's there again, one of those cliche things that you've heard a million times, but surround yourself with people you want to be, right? Not necessarily people that you are, like uh, try to aspire to the, the ones that, and surround yourself with the people that you would aspire to be, mm -hmm. because that's going to ultimately drive your succession as well to become, it's, everybody can say they, they're not competitive, but uh, if you have someone that is super successful and, and you're learning from them through osmosis and just being around them, you ultimately will get better at what you do. Networking is one of those, right? I, I actually absolutely hate the networking piece. Mm -hmm. Like it's just not something that I enjoy, but it's something I know I need to do. So I surround myself with people that are marketing geniuses and I'm like, okay, yeah, that's a little tidbit that I can add to my own repertoire as I go. Okay, good. That is sage advice, Nick. We mm -hmm. should, I wrote that down. I'm up to uh, nine lessons learned today. <laughs> um, all right. So I think the last question for you two guys is, is about growth, right? So um, finding the right clients, finding the right fits, walking away from clients that aren't good fits. Um, you know, how do you do that? How, how have you done that in the past? Um, what do you guys think? Yeah, I, I will double down on finding new clients and a lot of times the right clients through uh, fractional executive peer networks. Uh, I'm part of another very low cost. We're talking like 10 bucks a month group of fractional. They, they call themselves a CXO group. And it's a lot of um, people out here in the West Coast, but it, does cover the whole nation and it's smaller. Um, but I get a lot of referrals from COOs and CFOs, fractional um, COOs and CFOs that are already there. They have already engaged the culture of the prospect for us. So that means that the client is already open to the idea of fractional leadership. That's gigantic. If they come to you first, and they have never had a fractional anything before, it's going to be more difficult. It's going to be a much, much bigger cultural change that you have to engage upon. But if it's already been done, and in particular, I found if that COO or CFO is already in place, that means that the budget and the financials are going to be available to you. And so if they come to you and they say, I hate my MSP, I hate my ERP, I hate my, you know, all these systems, I want to rip it all out and, and replace everything. So I need you to come in and do that. Wow. Okay. That's a lot. And you, you kind of say, well, this, this, we have some help that we could do here, but let's talk about it. What, what are the main problems? Are you open to discussing them? And nine times out of 10, it's not truly a rip and replace situation. It's going to be a let's better utilize and train on what you have, because a lot of times the cost of change can be the bigger barrier of getting things going, but you want to be able to have those discussions early, particularly with the CFO at the table and the COO so that you can get it built into the budget so that things can happen as well as paying for yourself. So when you're engaging with that part of the community, it creates those types of right clients for me. In the past, I tried to just go straight the industry model and say, well, I know a lot of these guys need help. I'm going to go right in. And they looked at me as more of an MSP. And they basically said, well, can you also fix these computers? And, you know, yeah. why, why, don't, why don't you just do everything? And and I was just like, well, that's, that's not what we're talking about in the project here. Um, you have to look at the value prop and they understand why you're there. And so a lot of times, if a client does come to me, they feel comfortable. They they say that they want me to expand the services. I say, that's great. Let's talk about it. And it's something more technical in the weeds. Those are the ones that I then have to say, I think you're ready to hire an IT manager, um, somebody else. That's not going to be me. Let's, let's go through that succession process because maybe their foundational needs have been met. Got it. Make, that makes sense. So Nick, on the MSP side, how would an MSP create and then grow their uh, VC so practice. 
Well, from a from an MSP perspective, it's it's exactly what Sean was talking about, right? It's it's the land and expand, but becoming advisory, mm -hmm. uh, like that advisory partner, if you will. No, there again, like Sean said, if you if they say, well, you're an MSP, you should be able to do everything under the sun. Mm -hmm. There again, knowing the limits of what you're comfortable with providing advisory services for um or what i what i would always consider or talk about the the deflecting right redirecting and deflecting is what what sean was talking about as well is hey we're we're still talking about this particular function from an msp perspective you you have to make sure you stay within the verticals that you're you're well known for um otherwise you can get into the the legality issues and if you give the wrong advice or make the wrong decision then you burn a bridge right if something goes wrong from an individual perspective it's a little bit different uh you know knowing like just going down the list a little bit knowing how much you can provide yourself and your time to your clients will define uh the number of clients so there is no right, right number for it's no it's not a universal number for the number of clients that you have um you could you could strive to have a hundred if you really wanted to uh and in that you would have to then make sure that you're uh expanding not only yourself but your practice to include your those other trusted individuals that we talked about earlier within your network so that you're you're spending less time per one but then you're also directing and, and managing those people within your practice to do the same value or provide the same value that you would. If you just want to do it directly yourself, yeah. you know, it, it all comes down to the monetary negotiations that you have, right? You have to make you have to make it make sense for you and your lifestyle and, and the things that you want to do. Um, you know, and, and and there again, knowing when to say no. There's there could be somebody throwing tons and tons of money at you saying, oh, I'll pay you 700 bucks an hour to do this. But you have to recognize that it's a dumpster fire and you don't want to get into that mess. Mm -hmm. Right. Or you say, let's have like Sean said, let's have a conversation and break this down into more bite sized pieces where we can split out some of these these deliverables versus it being that dumpster fire. Let's take care of the the fire. Let's put that fire out first. Then let's work on painting the dumpster. Then work on, uh, you know, replacing the wheel. <laughs> Fireproofing the, lid, the dumpster. Right? Mm -hmm. Fireproofing the dumpster, right? Let's let's make a process to not dump grease in the the dumpster anymore, so it doesn't start again. Not like breaking it down more into those bite-sized chunks that works within your verticals, and and then you can expand if you would like to, if you're or if you feel comfortable doing it. Got it. One one quick add there too, Steve, is it's a great point that Nick makes where you can monetize and passively uh, monetize your relationships around deliverables. So there was a question earlier on about what are the basic types of deliverables, you know, in this world? When you get started, for me, it's really a project plan. And then you get through this phase approach to a dynamic roadmap. And the dynamic roadmap then can lead to milestone-based billing points, as Nick made, so that each milestone could be managing different teams internally or externally, and the external ones could easily be monetized so that you're getting you're getting referral fees, you're getting potentially subcontractor uh -huh. fees, all of those pieces are heavily available and especially in the labor markets that are around right now a lot of the global um, developers and whatnot they are happy to give you a cut or a discount on those types of projects where you're still giving an awesome rate to the client but you're also getting a piece of that therefore you're strengthening your relationship you're making it more trustworthy everybody's getting a little bit of a piece of the pie and it's not just, well, I'm going to hand off this relationship and hope that it works. You're right. actually engaged in making sure it works, which is what the clients want. They want somebody accountable to make sure that a development project as a CTO works 
or a new ERP implementation with that implementation partner stays and, and works because a lot of times when you just wash your hands and step away, all of a sudden you check in and say, Hey, how did that imp ERP implementation go? And they're like, we, it didn't work at all. Like those guys right. suck. What, what happened? And you right. really do want to stay engaged and make sure that those things happen, but also, you know, make sure it's worth your while. Yep. Right. So yep. you're staying on as a manager, but you're bringing on a person to do the work and your referral fee is paying for your management time to manage that client and manage those projects. Yeah. So we're, we're getting a little tight on time. Uh, we have this one question that I really liked about who are your favorite clients? Why did you like them? Um, what was good about them? If you could just 30 seconds on an anecdote of those, then uh, I think we're getting pretty close to wrapping up. You go first, Nick. Yeah, I can. Uh, so I actually have two favorites. The first one is the um, the open minded client, right? Not ones that are very dead set in their ways that are uh, prescriptive, that they want you to do something very specific, more so wanting to have a relationship and take the value that I bring to them. And they're able they're able to, able to and willing to change or pivot if they need to. Right. Um, that's, that's kind of my favorite one is the, having the, the trusted relationship. The second one is, uh, you know, I would call them heavily funded just past maybe B or C round funding, right? Mm -hmm. Those startups, uh, that are, that are somewhat established, but you're able to come in and, and say, okay, as you continue to expand your business and continue to grow, these are the processes and methodologies you have to have in place to scale as your business grows, right? So it's it becomes the the nuts and bolts and the basis for for their business to grow. Um, because if they're successful at the beginning, they're also going to come back later on and say, "Hey, you really helped right. us out." Right. Let's let's work together again because you you helped us get started in the beginning. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Sean, you have I'll the last uh, closing anecdote. I'll boost that as far as capital raise. There's there's a lot of different flavors of clients in their stages of capital raise that makes them great to work with. If they've done a friends and family raise and you're really like <laughs> feeling beholden to helping out that community of investors, God, I love those types of clients because they are will, really going to bend over backwards to make sure things work and not just like light, you know, money on, on fire, and just walk away. Um, that's in contrast to a lot of the private equity and VC raises that can be out there. Now, there are some of those that are also very good and they'll bring in good people. So you do want to talk um, about what, what stage are you in, in your funding and your capital raises. So I love those. And I also, you know, really love um, nonprofits and being able to help out a company that's doing something good for the community. Uh, you can see that impact as well. So there's there's a lot of like good there. Those tend to be not always the most profitable jobs, but they can be a little bit more soul profitable. Yeah. So you, you, the you psychic have gratification is good. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. So we've been going through the audience questions. Um, there's anything, you know, pressing guys, shoot it over and, and we'll get to it. I think the the wrap up, you know, what did we learn? Um, if I go back over my notes, um, like I said, I have probably a dozen now, but the first one I heard was, was being a mentor mm -hmm. to a client and adding value by training the, the junior staff so that you're working yourself out of a job was Sean's comment, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was a great, you know, plan to put in place. Uh, the lesson, second lesson I heard was having a methodology um, around your practice, things that you know you do well, things that you know you don't do well, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that dovetails into the next one, which would be building the community. So finding resources who are experts in areas that you're not so that you can bring them in as, as you need them. Um, the whole peer group discussion was, I think, a great lesson. Um, and I think we need to do more on that and and answer some questions for folks. Um, the uh, 
uh, having setting the right expectations, having a tight scope, having a tight contract that clearly seems to be um, a very valuable thing, you know, doing your homework up front um, when you start your engagement so that you do the assessments, you turn over the rocks as you start so that you're not, uh, you know, not surprised as you're going, going through. Um, and then one I wrote down that you guys sort of hopped over was having a change order process. Um, if a client does want to change, um, you know, what's the process to do that? How does that extend your engagement? How does that change, you know, what you're doing and who you're doing it with? Um, so I will jot my five things learned down and we'll distribute them when we distribute the, the slides out. So everybody can, can actually add to that. Um, I think we'd like to take a few minutes just to thank Corinth uh, Technology, the sponsor. Uh, they help us with the artwork and the promotion and the marketing. Um, and, you know, for those of you that have clients that use either private cloud or, or have created a SaaS um, product, uh, working with client or, or at least talking with Corrent um, <clears throat> would be worth your time. They will definitely save you time, money, um, and allow you to build your practice, right? Allow you to get a quick hit with your clients by being able to save them a big chunk of their monthly uh, monthly bills. So thanks again to, to Corrent. Um, follow on actions. Uh, if you are not members of the LinkedIn group, um, please take a go up on LinkedIn, look up uh, query on uh, VCIO best practice. You'll find the group there. Um, the group's grown nicely over the past few weeks. And again, I would say we'd much rather have really good quality people in the group than, you know, having thousands of, of uh, more junior folks. Um, in the current world, they have a referral program. Um, it's called Cloud Leader. Um, again, if you do work with AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, uh, any of the cloud vendors, or if you do SaaS work, um, you should take a look at that. Um, Inner Onion, this is a self-aggrandizing plug. We did a survey last year on what um, partners want. So what do MSSPs want? What do MSPs want from their vendors? And we're going to do a, a refresh of that um, and we'll send that out. And we are definitely looking for um, input and feedback for those of you that work in that MSP space or that consultant space. What do you want from your vendors? How can your vendors um, add more value to you and uh, and your clients? There's been a couple of questions about how do we make sure that the quality of VC, VCIO stays high? And there's an organization called the National Society of IT Service Providers. And their reason for being, their goal in life is to um, raise the level of MSPs and uh, and technology, IT technology consultants. So that's what they do. That's why they're in, you know, in existence. And um, if you're not aware of them, please go check them out. Um, smart people, good, experienced people, um, nice folks and helpful people. Uh, and then the last bullet is for you to jot down on a piece of paper, you know, what are three things that you'd do tomorrow um, or later today uh, that we talked about on this session? Um, you know, the studies are that when you learn something, if you take action within 24 hours, um, you're much more likely to be successful um, at that. So the last piece of uh, uh, follow on actions there. And then just thanks for everybody. Um, Sean and, and Nick, any final closing comments? Yeah, a couple of the last questions uh, that came in, I think from Joshua were around timelines and um, other aspects. It's very variable. So I will say that look um, to the peer communities to talk about that per industry. And one that we haven't mentioned yet is Fractionals United. That's a great mm -hmm. free starting point to be able to get and dip in and talk and communicate so you look at fractionalsunited.com uh, and you can get a join um, for free so that'd be my closing statement
Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Nick, you get the last word. Yeah. Uh, you know, appreciate everybody being being uh, able to join us. Um, you know, these are these are something that I really enjoy because we we not only get to, you know, tell people about our experiences and how to better them, but, you know, I, I look at it as a, a learning opportunity from Sean too, right? Because we're both kind of in different worlds, but somewhat the same and it bleeds over. So it goes back to just just try to be uh, as network oriented as you can, right? Um, making those connections. Uh, I tell people I'm the most extroverted, extroverted introvert ever, um, but it's something if you want to be in this this type of position or or in the industry, you have to be able to at least talk to people and, and be able to network a little bit. So, um, you know, that's that's probably what I would say is is the uh, the last comments and and the one last plug I would say is learn technical writing uh, if you're going to do this too, right? Uh, Going back to kind of what Sean was just talking about, uh, creating the SOWs, proposals, all the contracts that you have signed, uh, make sure that uh, you understand the verbiage in there okay. and be able to be, to be able to write it yourself, right? Because ultimately uh, you're held to what your, what your signature is uh, associated with, so. <laughs> Great. Okay, so I will wrap up. Um, thank you guys. Fantastic working with you. Fantastic on the prep. Uh, I think this session had some really valuable lessons here. I would say um, we need topics for the next one. So put your thinking caps on. Let's do a little brainstorming and, and come up with some topics. I would say to the audience, hey, if you guys have topics for the next session, let's uh, definitely get those out. Um, and, you know, I appreciate everybody's time and everybody's participation and, you know, I think the more communication we have, the, the more valuable this is all going to be. So everybody have a great day. Thank you again. Um, and we'll see you on the next session. Bye-bye now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.